Good evening, everyone. We'll start in just a moment. Welcome. As folks are trickling in, just wanted to welcome everyone. Give folks just one more minute before we get started. Thank you, just one more minute. Okay, I think we'll get started. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us here tonight. My name is Megan Horgan Taylor. I'm the Chief Communications Officer for the City of Palo Alto. And we're here tonight to talk about the automated um, license plate reader technology that will be um, presented for council consideration in April. And with us tonight, we have Captain Rav Schneider, who will is the expert on this topic and we'll be sharing some information um, and we will be opening up for questions or comments at the end um, of his presentation. Um, did want to note that we do have the webinar feature where you could type a question or a comment um, in the Zoom feature. Um, and if there's time, we'll um, ask those questions that have been typed out if there are some. Um, as well as uh, if there's time, we'll take questions live um, to just raise your hand if that's of interest um, at the end of the presentation. Um, with that, I'll pass it off to Captain Rob Schneider, who will kick it off tonight. Uh, thanks very much, Megan. Uh, again, my name is James Reif Schneider. Uh, just by way of, of a very brief introduction, I'm a captain here with the Palo Alto Police Department. I'm in my 18th year here in Palo Alto. My current assignment is overseeing our investigative services division. So in other words, that's Detective Bureau. Um, as Megan said, uh, upcoming in April, the department intends to bring an item to the city council asking for approval to roll out uh, fixed ALPR cameras and some technology that goes along with that. So the purpose of this meeting um, really is to help us introduce that topic to you um, give you an overview of what ALPR is, how it works, uh, maybe demystify a few things, clear up some misconceptions, um, give you an idea of what we have in mind by way of policy and procedure uh, to make sure that we're using this appropriately if we're given permission to do so. And also, some folks were kind enough to submit questions in advance uh, and submit comments in advance, so I'll do my best to address those during the presentation. If at some point uh, a question comes to you that I appear not to have uh, answered, please feel free to put that in the Q&A section and I'll do my best to get to that at the end. Um, and just in case I forget to say it at the end, um, we are recording this. So in the event that you uh, either would rather not have your uh, voice recorded, then just be aware of that. Um, or also in the event that you need to step away uh, during the presentation or before it's concluded, we will be putting this recording up on the uh, PD website uh, in the next few days uh, so that you'll have an opportunity to go back and either watch it again or watch any portion that you weren't able to see tonight. So with that, thank you very much for your interest in the topic and uh, we'll move on to the next slide. So first off, let's just sort of get some common definitions here so we know what we're talking about. So automated license plate recognition, which I'll refer to as ALPR because that's a mouthful, um, it uses a combination of cameras and computer software to scan license plates of passing vehicles. So essentially, uh, the camera has been taught to recognize what the shape and uh, what the shape of a license plate is and where it would typically be. And cameras are positioned in such a way to capture where a license plate would be of a passing vehicle. So when the camera recognizes a plate, it takes a singular image of that plate, and that picture is then translated into a computer-readable image, 
which then is queried against a variety of law enforcement databases. So there are a variety of databases that police officers use on a daily basis, along with our dispatch center, uh, to look for stolen vehicles, to look for vehicles that have been used in a crime, to look for stolen license plates, to look for uh, missing persons, uh, missing children, et cetera. So there's all kinds of reasons why we might, as a police officer, query a license plate number during the course of our shift. This is automating that process. So the camera, as it reads the plate, is doing that same query. And if it recognizes a plate, that is of interest to law enforcement in one of these databases, it generates an alert to law enforcement in real time that that plate is present. Now let's move on to the next slide. So there's two different types of ALPR cameras. The first is a mobile camera. You'll see that picture on the left and uh, just to orient you, that's a light bar on the top of a patrol car if that's not obvious. And the uh, what looks like sort of a long skinny uh, light that is facing uh, us on the right hand side of that is a mobile ALPR camera. So as that patrol car is driving around town, that camera is doing the same thing. It's recognizing license plates it sees, taking photos, translating that into a license plate number, which is then queried against various databases. So the officer operating that car is notified in real time or relatively real time if the camera has captured a plate that's stolen or otherwise of interest. Uh, that photo uh, depicts the type of ALPR camera that the Palo Alto Police Department already has and has been using for about 10 years. We have one car that is outfitted with that type of camera and we've been using it, as I say, for about a decade. Uh, most agencies in the county, if not all agencies in the county, have one or more of these cars. Uh, the limitation on that type of camera and system is that obviously it's limited by the number of cars or license plates that can be seen by a single patrol car driven by a single officer as they drive around town. And it's also limited by the route that the officer takes during the shift. Um, on the flip side, on the right hand side of your screen, you'll see what's called a fixed ALPR. And that's really what we're talking about tonight. A fixed ALPR is the same type of camera, but it's mounted to some sort of infrastructure. So whether that's a stop sign, whether that's a light pole, a traffic pole, et cetera, or some other pole that's actually been installed uh, just for the purpose of holding the camera. But in any, in any case, this type of camera uh, is in one place facing one direction permanently, and it's capturing traffic that goes past that fixed location. Uh, the advantage to a fixed camera uh, as opposed to a mobile, is that you don't require staff to operate it. In other words, somebody to drive the car around. The camera is always working 24 hours a day. And these cameras are actually pretty useful at night as well. They're very functional under low light conditions, so they can be used and be useful 24 hours a day. Uh, in addition, um, you can position these fixed cameras at various locations around town where you know that there will be a volume of traffic going by in order to maximize the amount of data that you're scanning in any particular period of time. So uh, just to kind of close the loop there, what we're really talking about today is the fixed ALPR, which we don't presently have and that we would like to start using uh, as opposed to the mobile that we already have. Uh, next slide. So this uh, flow chart here is essentially intended to convey what happens when these ALPR cameras are in use. So you'll see the license plate uh, with, the, uh, with the sort of vanity uh, notation of California on the left. Um, when the car with that plate on it drives into the field of view of an fixed ALPR camera, the camera recognizes it as a plate, takes a photo of it, that photo is translated into data, which is then queried through a system uh, or a variety of systems to see if that plate is known to be stolen, known to be a stolen car, uh, known to have been associated with a previous specific crime, uh, known to be associated with a missing person that law enforcement is trying to recover or check on, uh, or otherwise uh, is of interest to law enforcement. Uh, it's also capturing the location, 
and uh, of the location of the vehicle. So even if the plate is not immediately recognized as being something that's of interest, uh, it is captured and logged at that time. And we'll get back to that in just a second. So once that's captured, uh, and actually let's go back to that slide for one moment. So once that uh, picture is captured and the location and time is date stamped and time stamped, um, hits, and that is what I'm talking about, the computer recognizes it through one of those databases as being a wanted vehicle for some reason. That generates a real-time notification to our officers in the field. For example, they'll get an audible and visual notation on their, uh, on their computer screen in their car, telling them that a stolen vehicle license plate, ABC, was seen uh, at this location traveling northbound. So that's enough information for an officer in the field to respond to that area or to the direction in which the vehicle was last seen and try to locate that vehicle, recover that stolen vehicle, make a stop on that wanted person, et cetera. So that's what we're talking about when we say a real-time alert or a hit. In the alternative, if a vehicle plate is scanned through the system and there's no particular want on it at that time, the third-party vendor that operates the system still stores that data for 30 days under our proposed policy. Why do we store it for 30 days? Because that plate could become relevant to an investigation of a crime that we don't yet know occurred. So for example, we could have a robbery at the shopping center. And by the time police are notified, the vehicle has already left. So we arrive on scene, we interview victims, we locate a witness. A witness says, hey, I saw a blue Ferrari with this license plate leaving the scene. So that's a good lead for us, right? So we go into this system, we query the cameras that are in the area of the shopping mall to see if that particular plate was located in the area. And we get, and we can confirm that plate was in the area and then work on that lead. Even better, sometimes witnesses give us imperfect or incomplete information when they describe what they saw. So we might have a witness who says, I saw a car, it was blue, it was four door, and it had a, uh, you know, it ended in the numbers eight, nine. Well, this system is actually smart enough for us to be able to query partial license plates to see if we can find something consistent with that description. It's even smart enough, believe it or not, to recognize make, model, and color. So if a witness says, I didn't see the plate at all, but I saw a blue Volvo station wagon leaving the, leaving the scene, we can query by those descriptors and see about finding a matching car. Now, does that solve our case for us? Not yet, but it gives our investigators a really solid lead to then investigate thereafter. So that's why we want to hold that data for up to a month to allow for witnesses to come forward, to allow for other surveillance video to emerge, and to allow our detectives to know what they should actually be looking for when they query in the system. Uh, next slide. So what problem does ALPR uh, address in our view as a police department? So as probably you've noticed, hopefully not because you were a victim yourself, but you probably know somebody who has or you've read about it in the news, um, there have been regional increases in a variety of property crimes in the Bay Area and, and frankly statewide and nationwide. Uh, some of the trends you've probably heard of are the theft of catalytic converters, uh, auto burglaries, thefts of vehicles, and organized retail thefts. Those are those things you sometimes see on the on television where you know very graphically there's a, a mob of people or a group of people that all go into a retail store at the same time and just start grabbing things and they're in and out within a minute or two with armloads of property. Um, so we're not immune from that here in Palo Alto. And in fact, even though we're a small to medium sized city, because we have a large luxury shopping center in town and um, a well-developed downtown and a California Avenue business district, we are certainly a target for some of those things. And so it makes it valuable for us to have any investigative tools we have uh, to combat those things. We've also, as you've probably read in the newspaper, albeit still rare, we've had some street robberies, we've had some assaults, we've even had uh, burglaries of occupied homes. Again, those aren't common, but when they do happen, they're serious enough that we want to make sure our investigators have the tools they need to identify and apprehend the folks responsible. So what do we know about uh, suspects 
that makes ALPR particularly attractive as a law enforcement tool. So we know that suspects frequently arrive at the scene of the crime and flee from the scene of the crime using a vehicle. So therefore, uh, you know, license plates become key. We know that suspects have started in recent years to overwhelmingly use either a stolen vehicle or a vehicle with a stolen plate in order to commit their crimes. Why do they do that? Because they're operating under the assumption that if a witness sees that license plate, it's not useful to law enforcement to find them because the plate belongs to an innocent victim. The car belongs to an innocent victim. Why did they start using stolen cars and stolen plates more so than ever? Well, because you may remember years ago, as recently as five years ago, you would see cars on the road with those paper dealer plates on the back when someone would buy a new car. Well, suspects used to use those to obscure their real plate or instead of their real plate, to anonymize their vehicle. Well, then the legislature here in California changed the law to require that dealerships start issuing serialized paper plates on new vehicles. So criminals had to adjust their tactics. And so they had to escalate to using stolen license plates instead of paper license plates. Um, we also know when it comes to crime that particularly property crime offenders, but others in general, they don't engage in crime only in one jurisdiction. So someone who commits a burglary in Palo Alto likely is not only committing burglaries in Palo Alto. They're committing burglaries in other jurisdictions, other cities, other counties, particularly these groups of retail theft offenders that are hitting our malls. They're also hitting malls in other cities. In some cases, we see them hitting Valley Fair in San Jose and Santa Clara on the same day as they hit us. Um, so being able to put cases together by identifying plates, even if they're stolen, that were seen in various locations, helps our investigators to tie uh, various cases together and work collaboratively with other investigators at other departments to put together a strong case for prosecution. Um, the other thing that ALPR does, just frankly from a financial and a staffing perspective, is that we're also not immune from reduced or impaired staffing at our police department. And that's a trend nationwide. There's vacancies at most police departments, we have them. And what that means is that there's to some degree fewer cops out on the street. So we wanna make sure the cops that are out on the street are able to respond to emergency calls for service. This frees up officers by providing them better intel in real time and better investigative intel after the fact. So it's really a cost-effective force multiplier. Uh, next slide, please. So what information is even captured by ALPR? So the, cat, the picture we have here is a sample image where we've blocked the actual plate. But essentially, this is the type of vantage point that your average ALPR camera is going to have. It's installed deliberately to capture the rear of a vehicle. Why the rear of the vehicle? Two reasons. One, we're trying to be sensitive to privacy concerns because we are, to a certain extent, taking pictures, right, of vehicles that are, I'll call, innocent, right, that people who are just driving on the roadway, minding their business, and their, their plate is being uh, photographed. So by capturing the rear plate, we're minimizing the uh, chances of collecting, of taking and collecting photographs of law-abiding drivers. The other reason to take a picture of the rear is actually a practical one. Despite the fact that the California Vehicle Code requires every vehicle to have both a front and a rear license plate, some of you on this call probably don't have a front license plate because your car looks better without one, or you have a neighbor who doesn't have a, car, a license plate on the front because they think that their car looks better without one. So by positioning these cameras to capture the rear of vehicles, we have a better chance of capturing a license plate that's actually there. Um, so an ALPR system a camera is installed for uh, a specific purpose, and that is to capture a picture of a license plate and hopefully enough um, of the rear of the car to allow that computer system to work its magic and be able to capture, uh, derive or uh, divine a picture, a make, a model, et cetera. Um, that's what it's capturing, date, time, location, license plate, and vehicle characteristics. That's it. Could it perhaps capture a pedestrian in the background? Could it capture a, a, a 
a passenger in the back seat who's turned, or, you know, who's rear facing. It could, but that's unlikely and it's not the design of the system. Uh, next slide, please. What is not captured by ALPR? I think that's just as important because I think there are misconceptions about that. So a fixed ALPR system is not intended to capture images of a vehicle's occupants. Like I said earlier, it's intended to capture and it's aimed to capture the rear plate of a license of a car. So uh, our goal is not to photograph the occupant. Our goal is to photograph the car. Um, it probably should go without saying if we're not taking pictures of people that it's not using facial recognition software, but just because that is out there and some people may believe that they're one and the same, I'm here to tell you that ALPR cameras, certainly the ones we're looking at, are not facial recognition enabled, and we have no intention of using them to photograph faces, much less identify folks using uh, facial recognition software. Uh, next slide. So some of you, I won't ask for a show of hands, may have received a red light camera violation ticket, or you may know someone who did. And if you did, you may have seen one of these photos. Red light cameras are uh, pictured. They're very uh, purpose-driven. They're installed facing oncoming traffic in order to capture cars that are passing the limit line after the red traffic signal is eliminated, right? Is illuminated and someone is running a red light. And in order to issue a citation for a red light violation, law enforcement needs to be able to identify who the driver was because a red light ticket is not issued to a car. A red light ticket is issued to a driver. So red light cameras must, by definition, be uh, positioned to try to capture an image of the driver for purposes of identification and ticketing, right? Conversely, as I said, ALPR systems are designed and installed to capture the rear license plate because we're interested in identifying the car, not identifying the driver. Next slide. So ALPR comes with a whole host of legal considerations that we need to be cognizant of as we consider deploying them here in Palo Alto. So I'll start at the local level. So the city of Palo Alto, like a lot of other cities and counties uh, in the Bay Area and statewide, a number of years ago, uh, and passed a surveillance ordinance. So our surveillance technology ordinance uh, Im uh, imposes a number of rules and regulations on the city and city departments and hoops that we have to jump through before we can get the blessing to move forward with any kind of new technology that fits the definition of a surveillance technology. So in this case, ALPR meets the definition in the ordinance of surveillance technology. So therefore we have to meet the requirements of the city's surveillance technology ordinance. That ordinance requires that we go before council to get their express permission to use this technology. It requires us to go before council with a surveillance use policy that they would read and approve that tells them exactly what we're intending to use it for, what constraints we're putting on ourselves, what controls we're putting on ourselves with regard to training, monitoring use, auditing use, logging use, all of those things, what we are and aren't going to use it for. And ultimately what the ordinance says is that the council is supposed to weigh the benefits of using this new technology against any costs or concerns that are raised by the use of this technology. So that is what we'll be asking the council to do on April 3rd when we go back to them uh, with an action item, asking to purchase cameras and asking them to bless the purchase as well as the associated policy that'll govern the use of the cameras. So in addition to the surveillance ordinance here in Palo Alto, state law also speaks to this issue. So state law was, a, a state law was passed a number of years ago uh, as ALPR became more prevalent, which required that any municipality that wanted to use it needed to have certain types of training, needed to have certain types of limitations and controls on who could use the system, who could access the data, and also requires us to have rules and regulations limiting with whom we would share the data. 
Next slide. So as we are, uh, as we contemplate those things, the surveillance ordinance and applicable state law, we have to come up with a policy. As I, as I mentioned earlier, we have to come up with a surveillance use policy that the council will review and hopefully approve. Um, just like a number of other law enforcement sensitive databases that our officers and our dispatchers use on a daily basis, this is very much similar. It's collecting data for a law enforcement purpose we have to limit who looks at it and why. The language we use in law enforcement is you have to have a need to know the information and you have to have a right to know the information. So I can't go into our ALPR database if it's approved and search for my old high school girlfriend's license plate to see where she's been. I can't go in there just to see what cars have been going past the intersection of Middlefield and Embarcadero because I'm curious. I have to have a specific investigative need to make a query of that data. So I have to have a case I'm investigating that I can point to as to why it's relevant that I know that data that was captured. And a misuse of that law enforcement data would fall under the same category of a misuse of any other variety of law enforcement databases that our officers and dispatchers use regularly. And that is that unauthorized use or improper use can actually subject the officer or dispatcher to a criminal penalty to include arrest, not to mention uh, termination. So we train our employees on all of those regulations on a regular basis. And we would aim to train our employees specifically as it relates to the limitations on ALPR usage. Um, and just the same way that in most databases, if not all that we use, queries or searches are logged and they're auditable. So in other words, we can go back after the fact and see who looked for this license plate, who looked at all, um, and what reason did they list because it will require them to provide a case number and a reason for the query. We can go back and assess whether it was an appropriate or unauthorized search. Um, and we intend to do that um, on a regular basis to ensure that our staff are doing the right thing. So who do we share the data with? That's a big question. And it was one of the questions I think submitted by a member of the community as we were uh, preparing for this. So the answer is that this information is law enforcement sensitive. So it's only accessible by law enforcement. But beyond that, agencies are free more or less to choose with whom they share their data. Some agencies share their data with a regional law enforcement clearinghouse. In other words, that database then becomes accessible to all kinds of law enforcement agencies, state and local, even federal, um, to search that data as they see appropriate. We would take a different path. Uh, because we want to make sure that we have more control over our data and we are uh, cognizant of who's viewing and using our data, we will elect to share our data only with individual agencies with which we have a memorandum of, of understanding where we know that they're applying similar controls that we are and we feel that there's no risk of misuse. Um, specifically, we would not be sharing with out-of-state law enforcement agencies. We would not be sharing with federal agencies. And specifically, we wouldn't be sharing with any agency for purposes of immigration investigation or enforcement. Um, moreover, just to make clear, this is law enforcement data. So even though we're using a third-party non-law enforcement vendor to run the program, the data belongs to us. And the data is not sellable, even in any kind of anonymized form by the vendor. It belongs to us and they don't share it with anybody whatsoever. Um, how do we safeguard the data and how long do we keep it? So CGIS is uh, CGIS compliant is a fancy way of saying the data gets uh, transmitted and retained in an encrypted format that's consistent with the way that law enforcement agencies are required by law to protect data from hackers, et cetera, uh, or unauthorized uh, incursion. So 
our vendor or any vendor that we would be looking at for this would be required to comply with those things and prove that they have appropriate safeguards in place to, to uh, protect the data. And we have those safeguards in place here at the police department. How long do we keep the data? So functionally, the way this works is that the data is actually collected and transmitted to the vendor directly, and it's stored for up to 30 days. And I explained earlier why we would wanna keep it for 30 days. Um, at the end of 30 days, if we have not identified any specific image as being related to a criminal investigation, that data is purged and it's gone. So think of all that innocent data I referred to. You're driving to the grocery store. You happen to drive past one of these cameras. The camera takes a picture of your license plate and logs the fact that you were there at that date and time. Um, once 30 days goes by and it's and there's no indication or no uh, investigation related to your license plate, that data goes away and is not searchable any longer and there's no record of it. Only specific images that we flag as being related to a specific criminal investigation are kept beyond that 30 days. Um, one thing that I want to point out if I didn't already is that the majority of agencies that are using ALPR are keeping their data for a year, and in some cases, even longer than a year. We're trying to be as cognizant as possible of not keeping innocent, unrelated data any longer than we have to. So we tried to strike that good balance between keeping data long enough to make it useful for our investigators while not keeping it so long that we're keeping data unnecessarily that is not related to a criminal investigation. Uh, next slide. So I just wanna point out uh, on, in all in one place, how do we use L ALPR out in the field? How is it, how is it useful to the police? Uh, there's, two real, there's really two ways. One is proactive, which is those real-time alerts I'm talking about. That's I'm driving down the street in my patrol car and I get a beep and a message on my screen saying that there is a car associated with a murder suspect that was just at the corner of Page Mill and El Camino heading southbound. And I can look at it and it'll tell me that it was a blue Ford Mustang, for example. And now I'm gonna go look for that murder suspect vehicle, right? That's the real time proactive use of the, of the technology. The camera is recognizing a car that we are interested in. Reactive is the investigative side of this. That's what we were talking about earlier about having a database that we can query once we become aware that a crime has already occurred and try to use the data to identify a suspect. So the benefits, the real-time alerts, we're catching criminals and we're recovering stolen vehicles. We're finding missing people in the moment because we're getting that real-time intelligence of where that car is. We're deterring crimes. How are we doing that? Well, we know anecdotally from suspects that they're aware what communities are using ALPR and what communities are not, and that they are committing more crimes in communities that are not using ALPR, and they're making efforts to avoid communities or areas where ALPR is being used. So the mere presence of the camera, the mere visible presence of the camera can be a deterrent, but above and beyond that, Let's say I get one of those real-time alerts that there's a stolen vehicle in town. Very likely that that stolen vehicle is being driven by someone who's up to no good, who's driving that stolen vehicle because they intend to commit a crime. If I go to the area, and even if I don't find the car, they see me, they see the police response, and they're likely deterred from committing a crime that day. In my mind, even though we haven't made an arrest or recovered a stolen vehicle, that's a win if we can stop a, a new crime from happening. Uh, solving crimes already committed. We've already talked at length about that. We can use it to identify suspect vehicles, collaborate with other agencies, and that's the regional coordination part, right? The more information that agencies can say, can share, it's like putting together that puzzle, right? If somebody else has the corner piece of the puzzle, that might be the place where you need to start. Because if you've got an important piece, but it's in the middle, that's not really. That's not helpful. So putting those pieces together is, is really what puts together a good criminal case. Uh, next slide, please. So 
ALPR technology is an existing tool for many local law enforcement agencies throughout the country. A majority of agencies in our county and in the Bay Area are already using ALPR technology. So this is not something, this is not a new technology. It's not a new application of the technology. It's just new to Palo Alto. Um, these other agencies around us that aren't using it are actively looking into getting it the same way we are. So the use of ALPR technology has really, uh, has really expanded in recent years, and it's proven to be an invaluable investigative tool. The agencies we spoke to as we prepared for this had countless success stories about uh, cases that they were able to solve using ALPR data, and they were able to tell us that they were recovering more stolen vehicles, they were finding missing people, et cetera. So there are success stories in other agencies that we'd like to be able to replicate. Um, we've had specific cases in our town uh, to include an armed robbery at the shopping center where we, knew, we found after the fact that the suspect arrived in a vehicle that was known to be stolen. So if that car had come into the area of the shopping center and we had ALPR, it's very likely that that car would have triggered a real-time alert before the robbery occurred. So it's possible that an officer could have prevented that robbery from happening, or an officer could have been Johnny on the spot when the robbery was happening and interrupted it or apprehended the robber before they got away. So we have concrete examples where we know this technology could have put us in a better place to either prevent a crime or solve a crime more quickly. Um, the last thing on this slide I'll touch on is that there are individual agency or individual entities, businesses, shopping centers, parking lots, et cetera, that already use ALPR technology in other communities and in ours. So there's an opportunity for collaboration on a one-way basis. And what I mean by that is if a shopping center has an ALPR camera, and they choose to collaborate with us and share their data, we get the benefit of those real-time alerts and we get the benefit of being able to search their data after the fact, but they don't get to have any of our data because our data is law enforcement sensitive. So um, that collaboration and that expansion of the searchable database can really be an opportunity to help us uh, solve crimes. Next slide, please. So where are we in this whole process? So the first thing we did was go to the city council for a study session on ALPR back in October of 2022, about four months ago. Um, and at that time, we gave the council an overview of the technology, the potential for its use, the issues around its use, and we uh, got some valuable feedback from the council members at that time. The next thing we sought to do was to gather community feedback. And this meeting is, is very much a part of that. Uh, we published a website, which some of you hopefully have seen with frequently asked questions and some other information, as well as uh, scholarly articles about the use of ALPR uh, to include articles about the concerns about the use of ALPR. So I'd encourage you, if you haven't already, to look at that. Um, after tonight, um, we'll be incorporating any questions or comments uh, into our preparation for the city council meeting in April. And obviously, and I'll say this again later, um, we are scheduled to appear before the council on April 3rd with a deployment plan, a draft agreement, a surveillance use policy. And if you feel strongly about this issue, either you support the use of it or you have concerns about it. Uh, I wanna point out that that's an opportunity for you to submit a comment in advance or to speak on the third uh, on this topic. So in parallel to all of this, we're working on a procurement process. You'll notice I haven't mentioned a specific vendor name, and that's because the, the purchasing or procurement process is not complete, so I can't do that yet. But we're zeroing in on a vendor that we feel good about uh, that has experience in this space and that other agencies have had success working with. And so we feel good about where we are uh, in that process. Uh, next slide, please. So we're to the final formal slide where I'll remind you again that um, there is additional information about this topic that you can read at your leisure um, on the website that's noted there where we've gathered information on ALPR, um, 
the good, the bad, the ugly, et cetera. And there's also a form there where you can either choose to submit input or questions for the police department to consider as we prepare for the council meeting, or you can actually submit your own comments uh, to be directed to the council as part of our packet. So I'd encourage you to go to that website. Um, if you have friends or neighbors that are curious, please direct them to the website uh, for the same. Um, what I'll do now is I want to make sure that I've addressed the questions that were submitted in advance of the meeting. So I want to hit those first before I find out whether there are any questions in the uh, Q&A uh, section of the webinar. So um, we did have a question from a resident who asked, well, you know, is this information already being collected by a private company in Palo Alto? Um, presumably, uh, I think the question was whether there was a need for us to have this because isn't it being collected otherwise? Um, I can't say whether there's uh, any widespread use of ALPR uh, throughout Palo Alto right now. Um, I can tell you that I'm not formally aware of its widespread use. And even if it is being used by private entities right now, I can tell you that we don't have access to that data in any kind of searchable way. So. Um, if this data is useful, uh, it is something we'll have to start collecting um, on our own and have appropriate safeguards as we do that. The other question that was asked was, um, if this is only going to identify a vehicle and not a driver, what does that get us? Why is that even valuable? Well, the answer is that sometimes people commit crimes in cars that belong to them, right? So that can be helpful because it gives us an investigative lead as to the registered owner of the car. Uh, the other way it can be helpful is, as I said, piecing together information. So if we can find out that this same car is that was uh, seen at our crime is also being seen at the same place in another city repeatedly on their ALPR, well, maybe that gives us a lead as to where our suspect lives and we can go look for our car and hopefully apprehend and identify our suspect. So, uh, Figuring out what car we're looking for can often be a great first lead in identifying a suspect. Um, the last question that was asked was, um, can't a car that's validly registered go anywhere it wants to go? And I would say, generally speaking, yes, that there's no prohibition. And certainly this isn't intended to infringe on anyone's rights to travel on the road with a safe vehicle that's validly registered. Um, so the answer is yes. Um, couple of other questions I have here. Um, one, uh, one community member wanted to know if we would be using the same ALPR vendor as other surrounding agencies. And I think I sort of answered that, which is we don't know quite yet. Um, although uh, we are certainly aware of what product is being used successfully by other agencies. Uh, can Palo Alto PD and other agencies retrieve and share information in real time? The answer is yes we could collaborate with and search data belonging to agencies that we have that memorandum of understanding with. So we agree in advance that we're gonna share our data. Um, will we roll out a test deployment to get any bugs worked out? So I certainly would expect that any vendor we go with would run an extensive test on the product before we went live with it. And we might in fact have one car equipped with the alert function to start to see how that goes. But by and large, we're looking at vendors who, uh, at multiple vendors who've been doing this a long time, have already demonstrated that they've largely worked out the bugs. This isn't a brand new technology. It's, it's a well-vetted technology that we feel pretty good about. Um, the last couple of questions were, uh, does this have any implications as it relates to SB 1421 and AB 748? Um, for those that are unfamiliar with Senate Bill 1421 and Assembly Bill 748, in shorthand, those were laws enacted within the last few years requiring law enforcement to disclose certain types of information and certain types of records related to either sustained allegations of misconduct by police officers or in the case of certain types of uses of force by police. Um, I would say this, there's probably very limited, if any, interaction between this uh, topic and those two laws, because it's really unlikely that a static image of a license plate on the back of a car would have any relevance to one of those types of circumstances. 
Um, but nonetheless, if for whatever reason we became aware that um, that that type of uh, that that photograph of that plate was somehow relevant to one of those investigations, we have the ability to flag it. We have the ability to keep it beyond that 30 day purge period. And we have the ability to produce it if we're legally, um, if it's legally appropriate for us to do so. Um, lastly, there was a question about uh, what the proposed changes would be to our existing LPR uh, policy. So the answer is there'll be extensive changes. And why is that? Because our current policy only really contemplates that one fixed camera that we have on top of a patrol car. This is a whole new ball game. And so one of the things the city council will be seeing on the third is a draft surveillance use policy that will specifically address the use of fixed ALPR. So I think I've answered the questions that were received in advance. Uh, Megan, did we have questions in the Q&A that I can try to tackle with a few minutes to go? Um, I don't see any questions at this time. Um, if there are questions that the community has, feel free to put them in the Q&A and the Zoom. Um, or you could also raise your hand and I'm going to unshare because sometimes that makes it difficult to see. Are there any questions from the community? You can certainly take those if there are. I don't see any at this point. Are there any questions, Captain, that um, you had that people submitted that were um, outside, outside of the ones that you shared already? is hearing you, Megan, um, but uh... it might be my network. Looks like my internet connection is okay, but I'm having some struggles on my end. My end. I think you. I think we both are having struggles on our end. <laughs> um, I don't see any hand raised or um, any questions in our any features in our Zoom feature. Okay. Well, absent any additional questions, assuming you all can hear me, um, I appreciate you. everyone's uh, interest in the topic. I appreciate those who made the time to attend. And uh, for those who may not have uh, had a chance to see this live, but are watching this at some subsequent time, uh, do feel free to submit a question or a comment through that portal that we referenced on the city's website. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Captain, and for the community that participated tonight. We appreciate the interest and we'll um, make sure to share information through our social media about the next steps in the process, as well as the link to share more information, including the frequently asked questions. So with that, we'll close. Thank you so much. Good night. Have a good Thank night. Everyone. Good night. Thank you.